If you've ever wondered why some people can be on the carnivore diet for a month or so and have absolutely no cravings, while other people can be on the carnivore diet for up to six months and still be craving those carb-rich foods, the answer is in this video. Today, I talk with Dr. Sarah Zadar. Sarah received her doctorate in exercise physiology and nutrition from the University of Miami. She's currently a professor of nutrition at Miami-Dade College, and she's also a full-time content creator on platforms like YouTube and Instagram. Just before we meet Sarah, please do me a massive favor and smash like and subscribe. This helps me to be another voice out there spreading the word about the carnivore way of eating. Let's meet Sarah. Sarah, how long have you been a carnivore? A long time. Um, and it wasn't overnight. I did paleo and then keto, and then I transitioned very slowly and hesitantly <laughs> to the carnivore world and initially also got sucked in, you know, because of that addiction. Um, I got sucked in into, oh, sweet potatoes are okay and honey, and then that became a problem. And so it's been years. Um and even after I took away the sweet potatoes and the honey, I still sort of kept in artificial sweeteners like Gatorades or element packs that are flavored, um, Quest Bar here and there. You know, I still didn't fully appreciate the weight of the sugar addiction. Um, so I would say the beginning of 2023, like right around the time we went to film the first ever carnivore diet TV series, Reverse TV. So um, right around uh, like right around that time before we flew to Costa Rica. So I would say December 2022, January 2023 is when I really I feel um, cleaned up the diet even more. And, and I wasn't casual about artificial sweeteners or, or any addictive substances anymore in my diet. Oh, nice. And so. Uh, after cutting out those sweeteners, did you did you notice yeah. much of a change? I got keto rashes. <laughs> it's so funny, right? Like you think you're doing carnivore, but I, I think the keto rashes that a lot of people are getting, I think it's a detox uh, symptom from the sweetness from the it's a drug, right? The, those studies that are being done on uh, the how addictive sweet taste is. Not only does it show that the sweet taste is far more addictive than cocaine, actually, we have studies now that prove that it's more addictive than heroin by a large margin. So, um, yeah, so so that's that's what happened. Another major thing that happened, um, no more cravings. No more constantly thinking like, can I have one more bottle of Gatorade? <laughs> you know, or sometimes it would be the 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 goal was to have let's say one or two generally one quest bar a day but then very often you'll have four in a day you know like you'll have one day a week where it's like oh i'm just way too busy to have a meal so i'm just gonna have another protein bar and keep going you know and then it's like another protein bar and so it, was, it became a problem and so once all those things got cut out um i no longer had cravings I have to say, yes, another major, major thing that happened, I felt a sort of invincibility mentally and physically that I had never felt before. But I have to say that that coincided with an uptick in my training because that was around the time when I was doing all the research on sugar addiction and the dopamine in the brain and the dopamine receptors in the brain and how they get destroyed with addictive foods, right? And so the reason why I cut out the artificial sweeteners is because I saw those heroin studies and it's so funny because I did my dissertation on addiction, you know, exercise and addiction. Like that was my PhD dissertation. I defended that. That's how I got my doctorate from the University of Miami, right? <laughs> and I still did. I was still in denial, you know, like look how many years after that I was still in denial. It wasn't until I read those heroin studies that it it shook me to the core and I snapped out of the denial. I was like, it's impossible for me to ever get anywhere health-wise, fitness-wise, mentally. There, it, I'll never be where I want to be if I'm constantly dosing 
substances that are far more addictive than heroin. Like you'll never see a peak performer with a heroin habit, <laughs> a junkie, right? It'll not, it'll never happen. That's what snapped me out of it. And so because of that realization, I took out the artificial sweeteners and I took out anything addictive, even things like nuts, you know, how sometimes it's like, oh, you know, I'm not going to do carbs, but, you know, maybe once a week, there are a lot of people, it's like they think that nuts is, even though it's probably the single most horrific lectin bomb <laughs> you can put in your body. Um, you know, even things like that, even dairy, you know, I took out because of the addictive profile. So anything addictive was out. And it was nothing, it was nothing but the meats that I kept. So I did that. And I also started repairing the dopamine damage in my brain because I understood that there is this serious addiction and you can take away the drug, but when you take away the drug that was giving you that dopamine hit, you're left with a vacuum in your brain, right? You're left feeling anhedonia, which is a flat mood. And that's why people relapse. And that's why people just can't stick with any diet or a carnivore diet long term. And so the relapse rate is pretty high, maybe not as high as other drugs, um, diets, because they have less drug like foods than other diets. But still, uh, I, I think a pretty high percentage of people who try to do carnivore eventually fall off the wagon because they don't fully appreciate what happened to their brains, dopamine centers, and how they need to rebuild that. Um, so when you take a drug, whether it is cocaine, heroin, or a cupcake. It releases way too much dopamine. Every time you have a an unnatural release of dopamine to such super physiological levels, kind of like taking a line of cocaine, it overstimulates you for so long. The brain freaks out. It doesn't know for how long that stimulation is going to last. So in an effort to preserve itself and your life so that you don't starve yourself because you're just not hungry and you're not sleeping and you're wasting away in an effort to protect you your brain starts to destroy the receptors that dopamine has to bind to for you to feel the effects of dopamine it's like a lock and key situation dopamine gets released binds to the dopamine receptors called d2 receptors on the cell surface of adjacent brain cells and that's when you feel the high the energy the everything that we relate to dopamine and so in an effort to protect you, the brain starts to destroy and downregulate the amount of D2 receptors on the cell surface of adjacent brain cells. And so now, even if you're taking the drug, yeah, you're releasing all the dopamine, but it doesn't have enough D2 receptors to bind to. So in, in essence, you don't have the same high anymore. And this is how people eventually get into depressive states when they have any kind of addiction because unless you're taking the drug your baseline mood your baseline level of functionality now has dropped compared to where it was before you started take before you started that addiction right and so the vast majority of the time addicts spend most of their time taking the drug just to bring their mood back up to normal not to get high. It's almost, it's very hard to get high unless they take like a lethal dose or very close to that. You see? In interesting. Mm hmm Yeah. So, yeah, so the dose just keeps getting higher and higher and higher to bring you back to just baseline. Exactly. Because, yeah, so this was your baseline mood, which is dictated by your baseline level of dopamine and D2 receptor amounts. That was your baseline. The addiction, as addiction takes hold and time goes on, your baseline level of mood becomes lower and lower and lower and lower. And this is how you build tolerance, right? Now you have to take even more of the drug to to, to even just attempt to go back to normal, you know, because your baseline is lower. So more you have to take more drug to back, bring it back to normal versus in the initial phases of the drug yeah your baseline is here but you take a little bit extra you go back now it's here take a little more extra to go back to normal <laughs> you see you never feel high we don't remember the high from sugar anymore because <laughs> they gave us the drug when we were infants so nobody's getting higher from sugar anymore unless you have babies around you and you want to mess them up for life <laughs> give them some sugar and watch their high yeah that's that's so interesting so um the what what kind of pushed you towards this area 
Um, mm, well, I think I've struggled with my, um, I've struggled with everything, acne, weight gain, depression, anxiety. And now I understand the depression and the anxiety um, were, were me being an addict. You know, it's, it's like asking a heroin junkie, why are you depressed? It's like, duh, they're an addict. <laughs> get sober first. And I didn't understand that I had to get sober with my diet for my mood to really get to, to feel the way we're supposed to feel invincible, like superhumans. And that's how I felt. You asked me, did you feel a shift when you removed the artificial sweeteners and all those things? Yes, I felt not only a shift, it was a life changing moment for me. It completely reshaped every all my content, the way I worked with my clients, everything changed. It was like a major eureka moment because I felt it because I understood what we were dealing with and I snapped out of my denial. So I stopped destroying my D2 receptors and I started rebuilding them with exercise. That's the beauty of exercise. Dose and duration or time under tension and exercise leads to the building of dopamine and D2 receptors, even at baseline, even when you wake up in the morning. So not just during the workout session, but 24 seven, now you reset it. And the more the dose and duration and time under tension that you spend with exercise, the more dopamine and D2 receptor you build. And so, so now, you know, I remove the drug, no more destruction, and I'm building, building, building. And all of a sudden, I'm feeling superhuman. It's like, this is incredible it's like i'm it's like i'm on adderall 24 7 mm. you know without the crash it's like clean cocaine basically <laughs> get high oh, nice. no crash so it was a life-changing moment for me and my content my business and my clients and the way that i um uh train my client coach my clients now and and they're feeling the same effects it's it's mind-blowing really nice so yeah spe speaking of your clients um I, I've heard um, I've heard a few things about what you're doing. So I think you're you've uh -oh. got your YouTube business and <laughs> and you've all you're also teaching. Is that right? Oh yeah. So I teach at Miami Dade College. I'm a nutrition professor there. Um, that's just like a side job that I really should be quitting because I mean, come on, we're building an empire here. <laughs> what am I doing teaching on the side? You know, it just, it's not really, um, compared to what I bring to the table, you know, the, the, the monetary compensation is nothing, you know, and uh, at the same time, the influence is nothing. Cause it's like, what you have, 30 students. Well, now I have a, such a long wait list on my, everybody wants to take my classes because I have the highest ratings in all of Miami Dade College as a professor. So <laughs> they keep increasing the cap on my classes. So it went from, we only have like a 30 limit and, net, and then it's like 35, 40, 40, and I have 50 students in every section. And it's like, isn't that like something you're not supposed to do? But anyway, <laughs> so yeah, that's something that, um, Definitely, I am, you know, in the next few weeks, I'm planning to exit as my business is growing. Um, but yeah, I do that. I also but the main the main thing is really content creation, researching for um, new content, interviewing other, um, you know, leaders in the space. Um, also, I do one on one coaching. And I do group coaching, which is something very excited about with the group coaching. Um, we meet right now, we're meeting twice a week. So Sundays at 9 a.m. Eastern and Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. But it's growing so fast that I'm going to be opening up new time slots. And uh, it's like coaching slash support. So um, you can choose to turn your camera on or off. You can choose to just type in your questions or whatever. And I just like go over them and I help you and support you. Or you can just share something that you went through. Um, and then I'm recording all of those Zoom meetings so that people who sign in and join us can also go and watch all of the previous sessions um so it's very exciting stuff the coaching is very focused on addiction cravings getting onto carnivore that kind of thing or is it just basically getting yeah. onto some ketogenic form of diet i mean um i feel like most people who come to me they're at their wits ends they you know i'm not usually the first <laughs> option because when you first want to get fit or healthy 
you you go on Google and you try the 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 shiny objects first, which are you know the beautiful bowl of oatmeal and the acai bowls, all the colors and the excitement, and then you realize that that's not working, and then you try the macro counting and or if it fits your macros, I, you know I can have cake and still make it fit right it's like the calories in calories out model so um it it, it usually takes somebody that has went through a lot before they discover carnivore i get a lot of tough cases too um so i get a lot of people who have you know lupus who want to get pregnant like they're they're, they don't just want to get fit they also have other issues that you know they have to do carnivore um so with the keto, I remember when I first started coaching, I was still, because I was still doing the quest bars. So I would be like, yeah, it's okay. You know? <laughs> um, so now it's kind of harder for me to personally recommend keeping that. However, having said that, there are some people as we're building their dopamine and D2 level uh, stores and get them to become food sober on a carnivore diet, because the carnivore diet is the optimal food addiction cure, right? It is the, it is the ultimate food sobriety diet. And it makes sense. It's our species specific diet. It would make sense. It would be so perfect for that too. Like they marry well, those two notions, carnivore and addiction. So I do understand though, now more and more as I'm working a lot from this perspective, that there are some people who just have such massive dopamine D2 uh, receptor destruction or a dopamine deficit state that when, I, when you take out the drug foods, they're left with an even deeper vacuum, you know, and if, if they've been, if they've had so much destruction and on top of that, they don't have experience working out. So they don't have anything that had offset that food addiction and tried to repair some of the damage as the addiction was taking hold, kind of repaired some of the damage or, or kind of offset the damage with the exercise. So there's such at a low level of dopamine deficit that it's okay if they have um, a quest cookie here and there when 80%, 90% of the time they're carnivore, they're still moving in a net positive in terms of rebuilding the brain, you know? So I've realized that when, when we're a little bit understanding that, you know, a dopamine, uh, the different foods have different effects on our dopamine system. So if you're having a quest bar or a quest cookie that's high in protein, while it still is not food sobriety, but if you're, if you're going to have that and and that's going to allow you to not have 2000 calories worth of cakes and cookies that are going to do massive damage to that dopamine we're trying to fix, please take that because you know, that's going to actually lead you into a net positive gain in dopamine and D2 receptor levels by the end of that week, you know, and it might take a few weeks, you know, of that as your, because we need some time to build your cardiovascular fitness. We need some time to build your um, weight training, uh, fitness, musculoskeletal endurance and musculoskeletal strength. It takes a little bit of time to get there. As this is going up, you will actually naturally reduce self-administration of drug foods. And there's tons and tons of studies that I share with my clients about that. Because some of my clients are nerds just like I am and they love the sciencey stuff so um I share everything I collect and I keep for my records and I share it with them and there's so many so many studies that have been done on this very particular topic how exercise automatically reduces self-administration of heroin cocaine speedballs which are heroin and cocaine combinations like you can't get any more addiction than that you know I, although i would argue food can be more addictive than that yeah you can so you know um so so if exercise automatically reduces self-administration of these drugs then as long as the exercise fitness level is going up and up and up even if you have a slip up along the way it doesn't matter we're still going in a net positive direction in rebuilding dopamine d2 receptor levels until we get to a point where you don't even care for that protein keto you know like food that's not as addictive but still not as a really good food sobriety option you know what i mean 
So it's it's learning. It's like this art form of learning where your dopamine levels are at and reducing the damage as we build and keeping the base of building faster pace of building dopamine um, state compared to the destruction pace. Yeah. So this is a really interesting point for me because like on my channel, I find there are kind of two camps of people when they're on carnivore. Mm -hmm. And the first one is the the one that I I think I'm in myself, where like once you're two months, three months into carnivore, you've just got no cravings for anything at all. You know, yeah, that, um, like true. you can you can look at a piece of cake and you can go, yeah, that looks like rubbish to me. You know, yeah. And then you've got the other um type of carnivore which is i've been on this for two three four months and i'm enjoying it i love it but i'm still i've still got cravings yeah. is that just that they have depleted I mean. uh, depleted their levels too much perfect um, yes very yeah. well said it's a dopamine deficit state and um sometimes it's not enough to just remove the administration of the drug while only doing cardio sometimes a lot of times, actually, I would say that is the norm. 95 to 99% of individuals fall in the other camp where they go on carnivore, but they're still having the cravings. Maybe not as much as if they were doing keto and they're still administering the drug on a regular basis, right? But they're still very, very vulnerable. That's the majority of the population, um, which mirrors closely um, the overweight and obesity rates. The vast majority of people um, are severe food addicts. And even people, so if you can, you can look at around like 35% overweight, around 35% obese, right? So that's around 70% overweight and obese. That's severe food addiction. And then the remainder, 30% of the population, most of it is equally as addicted, but they just don't store subcutaneous fat or fat under their skin as easily as others. Because we do have that genetic um, variability that dictates how easily or more, how, how easy you can put on body fat. But that does not necessarily mean you're not an addict in the brain with a D2 receptor destruction and dopamine deficit state. There are a lot of people that are very, very lean. But try to get them to change their diet. Try to <laughs> try to take away their drug food, and you'll see how they'll fight tooth and nail to uh, protect that drug. You know, so it's real. It's it's uh, it's everybody. You know, and so this is the beauty of exercise. By the way, it's not just exercise. It's it's anything that inflicts emotional and or physical pain. It is the painful or discomfort sensation that is the signal the brain needs to trigger release of dopamine and D2 receptors so that it repairs the damage so that you your baseline dopamine levels and your baseline D2 receptor levels go back up again. Why would your brain ever spend an extra calorie energy or effort or time any resources to build those dopamine producing cells, to build those D2 receptor proteins on the brain cells. Why would it ever waste its energy doing that? You got to give it a reason. And the reason is that emotional pain, you know, the reason is the, the uh, physical pain. So even like things like cold plunges, so uncomfortable. Mm. It's like the brain's like, whoa, what if this happens in the future? Let me adapt, you know? By the way, you, it, you even just a craving for a food, that's a form of pain. That's an emotional pain, right? So if, if you're craving a food and you just sit in that craving and you let it pass, that episode of emotional pain also triggers the brain to release D2 receptors. But what do we do when we crave? <laughs> we run out and we take the drug. So we don't yeah. allow the brain, like we, we stop the, the reason that the brain needed to upregulate the dopamine and D2 receptor levels. So we actually end up with a net negative amount of dopamine in our brains because we go and now we destroy our dopamine even more by eating the drug foods. So so that means that just in that moment when you have the craving, if you can suck it up, yes. then, then it's going to be much easier next time because then the exactly. brain... Exactly. Uh, okay. Exactly. I don't like that approach, though. Um, if you can and are able to train, I think 
there is a form of empowerment and it feels so much better to bring that pain upon yourself when you choose, especially even first thing in the morning, you know, wake up and you bring it upon yourself when you are in control of the self-inflicted, self-inflicted pain. It feels better as opposed to being like the sitting duck, not knowing when that craving is going to hit you and you have things that you got to do. You want to be productive. Like mm. why? Yeah. Like I think it's better to have control over that process. Hmm. So I have a couple of addiction related questions that I'd love to ask you. So sure. what one of the addictions that I've yet to be a, a yet been able to kick is uh coffee. Mm. Um is it, that's basically the same mechanism. So coffee activates adenosine receptors but also dopamine all so there's a really cool paper I remember uh, reading. I had to read pretty much all the research on this topic for my dissertation, right? And and I, I just remember that title. It, it struck me as interesting. All roads lead to dopamine, meaning in any addiction, what happens is that you have a cascade event that releases all the neurotransmitters and neuromodulators in your brain, which it's like, one stimulates the release of the other, like serotonin release stimulates, I, I can't remember the exact order. So that not might not be the exact same order, but it could be, so it could be like serotonin release, kickstarting the release of acetylcholine, which kickstarts um, GABA, which GABA is an inhibitory, but you know, which then kickstarts um, uh, the uh, beta endorphin, which, e but eventually they all, it's like a cascade event that leads to the release of dopamine at the end, which is why we just focus on dopamine when we talk about addiction, because it all roads lead to dopamine eventually. But yes, caffeine activates the, actually it blocks the adenosine receptors. That's the specific um, pathway that it takes in the brain. And by blocking adenosine receptors, you cannot sense the accumulation of, um, sorry about the science guys. <laughs> it stops the accumulation of this other chemical called ADP, which is like the, the waste product of energy burning, which is why like in the morning you, you burn a lot of ATP molecules, which is our, the energy currency of the cell. As you burn ATP molecules, you release a lot of the waste product of it, which is ADP or adenosine diphosphate. The accumulation of ADP throughout the day, as it accumulates in your system, and it starts to attach the, the adenosine receptors, that is how you have the accumulation of the fatigue, which leads you to wanting to sleep at night. What caffeine does, it blocks the adenosine receptors. So you cannot sense this accumulation of this waste product or ADP accumulation throughout the day. And so even though it's building up in your system, you can't feel it. And that's how it makes you feel energized, you know? So ah, that is... Okay. The, the kind of like the the physiology behind the caffeine and how it works but this absolutely is a drug and you build tolerance and you're just drinking it to prevent the withdrawal effects not really to feel any jolt of energy it just it just you know after a very few short days or maybe weeks you're just drinking it to feel normal again yeah so uh, you know in your experience the research you've done um what do you think is the easiest to quit sugar or caffeine it's funny um i would say caffeine but it's funny that there are there's some people who will quit the sugar no problem but then struggle a lot with let's say the cheese or the caffeine <laughs> it depends on your specific neuromodulator neurotransmitter system which one one has most of uh, more of a deficit in it. You might be more vulnerable to one substance than to another. You know, mm. like for yeah. me, um, I know like if I'm stressed, especially historically in the throes of addiction, the first thought that comes to my mind is sugar or carbs or a combination sugar fat. You know, which is highly addictive. My husband, it's smoking. You know, he definitely, he, he's not a smoker, but if something major happens, like he'll go out and he'll buy a pack of cigarettes for me, it's like, or, or even alcohol, you know, for me, all the alcohol in the world does nothing for me. I, I, it just, it, it, I actively 
want to stay away from the effects of alcohol. It just makes me feel too like down. I'm already a very calm person. It doesn't do anything for my specific, um, you know, brain chemicals, um, cigarettes, same thing, you know? So it's like different people's brain systems have might be more deficient in certain chemicals than another person. And so that's why they react to a very specific drug, but not the other. Got it. So yeah, the, the other question was related to dairy. You mentioned dairy early on, um, mm. as like that's a that's an addictive thing or a craving thing. What is what is it about that that makes it addictive? So especially cheese. So okay, butter is addictive to a certain extent. I I filmed also a YouTube video. To, the, the thumbnail says butter is bad. And I stand by that and you can watch the video for, for more information, but anything that's, you know, energy dense has a lot of calories in a, in a very condensed manner where our brains are primed to seek that out. Because again, historically we have ancient DNA. So historically uh, we've been more afraid of famines than an overload of calories. And so anytime we found any kind of um, calorie dense or energy dense um, source, we would just, our brains would light up, right? And so butter does that for us, which is why I highly recommend you completely eliminate that from your um, environment. So there's that. There's also cheese being very highly addictive because cheese is mainly casein protein, right? So um, if you get a cup of milk, 80% of the protein is going to be casein, 20% is going to be whey. Those are the two main proteins in dairy, right? Casein and um, whey. The wh When you curdle the milk to create the cheese, the liquid watery portion, which is the whey, is discarded, and then you're left with all the casein. When you consume that casein protein, the body converts it into a form called casomorphin. Some like to call it caseomorphin, doesn't matter, same thing. Caseomorphin is similar to heroin, is similar to the opioids. It literally attaches and activates the same receptors that heroin does or morphine does, which are the opioid receptors. And so that is also a very addictive um, situation to be in, to be activating those opioid receptors externally like that, as opposed to um, the way it's supposed to happen, which is with your exercise, right? Um, and so that's why people can also develop a very easy addictions to, to cheeses because of that um, casomorphin molecule and the activation of the opioid opioid receptors. And then you can also say in certain situations like cottage cheese or milk, they also have lactose, which is a sugar. Um, anytime you ingest a sugar, it can also activate some biomechanical, uh, some, some, um, by uh, some physiological uh, mechanisms in the body that are similar to the ingestion of sugar. So there, there's a little bit of that happening as well, depending on how sensitive you are to that sugar. Interesting. So, um, I uh, I recently gave up cheese. I've I've for about almost a year I've been eating two hundred grams of cheese every day, and um, two hundred grams that's like six ounces. Mm. So yeah, yeah. I just uh, another another YouTuber challenged me to uh, get it out of my diet, and just for a couple yeah. of weeks. So I took it out and. Um, I was very surprised. Like I wasn't addicted to it, but I was very surprised about the difference. You know, my, I think for some reason it was causing me to carry a little bit of water because I very quickly lost weight around my stomach. Yeah. 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 I, I eventually, all my clients eventually also go dairy free uh, uh, after, you know, I progress them depending on where they, they're at, but eventually we have the talk about dairy and we eliminate it. Yeah. Because in the beginning, everybody loses weight very easily, but a lot of people, um, work with me. Some, some want to compete, you know, for like a bikini bodybuilding competition where they will be judged on physique, symmetry, proportionality, and they need to be conditioned to see the muscle underneath. And, and so, um, for those, um, clients, like we cannot be doing dairy. We cannot be, you know, it, it becomes a lot slower to see a scale change or a body fat change in those last few pounds. And so 
yeah, dairy has no place. It's got to go. A lot of people even way before that, you know, we remove the dairy. I have a client who we're about to celebrate his 100 pound weight loss like any day now because he's losing two pounds a week, you know, I mean, two pounds every two days, you know, so he, he loses six to eight pounds a week. So we're about to um, celebrate his 100 pound weight loss, um, maybe today or tomorrow. And uh, you know, we've, we've cut out the dairy from the get go, like maybe he's he, he kept the dairy, the cheeses and the and the some sour cream in the first two to three weeks. And then it's like, listen, you, you really want to do this and build that momentum and just stay motivated and excited. Let's just cut it out so that we, we just expedite this process and, it, and it's working beautifully. Mm. No cravings too. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. So um, if someone's been on carnivore two, three, four months and they, they've still got cravings, um, have you got some, off the cuff tips that you could give them, um, you know, patient sight unseen to uh, to potentially get over those cravings. Yeah, anytime you have a craving, it's a sign that you still have a dopamine deficit. So that means you need to upregulate dopamine receptor um, production and dopamine levels. And the way you upregulate or increase your baseline level of circulating dopamine and the number of D2 receptors, because you need both to feel the effects of dopamine, it's like a lock and key situation when dopamine gets released, it attaches to its D2 receptors. And only when that lock and key situation happens is really when you feel the high, the amazing benefits of dopamine, the energy, the motivation, the mental clarity, the memory, the productivity, the weight loss, because you have no cravings. And so every time you still have a craving, it generally means you're still in that dopamine deficit state. And so then that means whatever your fitness level is, I, again, am I... My preferred method is exercise. I think it's just one of the best tools we have. It's the most effective tool to um, increase dopamine and D2 receptor levels as quickly as humanly possible. And so it just means wherever your cardiovascular fitness and musculoskeletal strength and endurance are right now, they still need to go higher to, because every time they go higher, that equals a higher baseline level of dopamine and D2 receptor levels, right? And so... It just means that we're not there yet. Keep working mm -hmm. harder at the gym, train, uh, add an extra session or ramp up the intensity. And uh, eventually the frequency and intensity of the cravings will start to drop as the uh, physical fitness level starts to go up. It's like, like that. Mm. Inversely and proportional relationship. Yes. So, so could that be as, as, um, easy as someone just going, I'm going for a walk and I'm going to make that walk longer no. than it was yesterday. No, 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 no. Yeah. Walking will never get you there. Not in a million years. Right. It's got to be some level of discomfort. And the more the discomfort and the, the more time of discomfort, the, the greater the time under tension, the more dopamine and D2 receptor levels. Got it. Yeah. Mm. Because if you're if you're just walking, there's almost zero discomfort there, unless unless you were bed bound, and now the walking gets you out of breath. Then yes, then obviously that's going to upregulate some dopamine D two receptor levels compared to in the past. Um, but most people can walk no problem, and mm. you, we are so if you're walking no problem, and you're still having cravings, and you know you're still in a in a do dopamine deficit compared to where you need to be to not have those cravings anymore. Got it. That's yeah. uh, that. That's really good advice. Um, really good to really good to hear something so specific. Um, so, um, Sarah, if people want to reach out to you, if they want to check out your channel, or they they want to contact you about some kind of coaching, um, how can they do that? Yeah, so you can definitely email me. Uh, that's like the fastest way. Doctor Sarah Zaldivar at gmail dot com. It literally dr and then first first name, last name, which you can see on the screen. They can see it right on the screen. Yeah. So yeah. D-R, yeah, D-R-S-A-R-A-H-Z-A-L-D-I-V-A-R at gmail.com. Um, you can also follow me on YouTube and Instagram. It's very easy to find me. My Instagram handle is at dr.sarah.zeldivar. So my name but was just dots after the doctor and the Sarah. And then my YouTube channel, Dr. Sarah Zaldivar, very easy to find me. 
Thank you so much for your time today, Sarah. I really appreciate you coming on and talking to us. Absolutely, Dave. Thank you so much. Guys, thanks for watching. Please don't forget to click like and subscribe. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next video.